Welcome to Metrocasting, I'm Doug Farley. Behind me is part of what is left of the old ACF complex in Berwick, and that is where they made those now famous Stuart Light Tanks during World War II. Well, recently during the Columbia County Bicentennial Celebration, one of those Berwick-made tanks actually came home for the weekend, and as you will see, it came home to much fanfare. You are looking at rare 8mm home movie footage of a number of Berwick-made Stuart light tanks as they were being paraded along Front Street in Berwick during an early 1940s celebration of America and the rolling out of Stuart tank number 1000 coming off the assembly lines of the old American Car and Foundry, the ACF complex in Berwick. As you can see, it was quite a big event with plant workers from the various ACF departments marching along with the tanks and local bands and much more. So imagine the excitement when one of Berwick's most famous native sons came home after being away for more than 70 years. This was the scene at Berwick's <laughs> Test Track Park during Columbia County's Bicentennial Celebration as one of the over 15,000 Stuart Light tanks made in Berwick during World War II came home for the weekend. Hundreds of people, including former ACF workers or their family members, stop by for a glance at what good old American know-how and ingenuity looks like. Stories of how the tanks were made and tested and where they were used during the war years were shared between onlookers as well as by people like Fred Shepperly, who you may remember from a previous episode of Metro Casting. Fred and others from Berwick who knew the tanks from making or working on them worked for the Marines as salvage artists and spare parts men in the Pacific during World War II. That smile on Fred's face never disappeared for the entire two hours he spent with his old friend telling stories and showing pictures. It has been 70 years since you stepped inside one of those tanks. What was it like getting back in again? <laughs> well, it was a, cr a real oddity. I couldn't imagine even how the interior was uh, put together and uh, also the controls, uh, although I was familiar with them after driving many hours in them, uh, it was still a new experience to me. Uh, I would hope that uh, someday soon we're able to get a tank back and get it placed over in Berwick in a nice site and that uh, we can uh, remember this as uh, the start of getting it back. During our previous conversation with Fred, he explained why the Stuart light tanks were so invaluable to our armed forces, especially in the Pacific during World War II. Well, they wanted to use the Berwick tank because uh, a lot of those islands over there uh, had uh, coral reefs and uh, medium tanks couldn't ford the water like, like the light tanks could and we lost a lot of tanks right down in the water. Uh, when, the, when an LST grounded, they grounded against these coral reefs and, and when they dropped the bow and you went out with a tank, you just dropped in the water, you know? And uh, the light tanks were maneuverable and there was many of them so that uh, they could be around everywhere. Then our, our site became a site whereby after each operation, these ships would bring all these tanks back that had been mutilated one way or another, disabled. We piled them up there and uh, we got directives that you got to save every vehicle because we have no idea how many we're going to need. So this meant that my crews we're busy day and night repairing, putting new engines in them, putting new transmissions in them, and uh, getting them serviced even after they had already saw a campaign, you know? So this, this was a, uh, an ongoing for months from one island to the other, bringing them back and servicing them. Now Fred was just one of thousands of people who worked at the ACF before, during, and after the war. And as Tom McLaughlin of the Borough of Berwick Stewart Tank Committee told us, the ACF and Berwick were of more than just a little concern to Adolf Hitler. It was so important that the Berwick plant 
was on Hitler's America Bombers hit list. He had picked he handpicked 19 targets in the United States if he could get bombers to reach here. And Berwick was one of those targets. It was that important to the Allies. And these tanks fought everywhere in, during World War II. We have pictures of them in the Aleutians, in Antarctica, in uh, Burma, in New Guinea, uh, North Africa, all over Europe and they were in every Allied army in, uh, involved in the war. And a couple you know, of our enemy uh, armies that captured them from the British or the Russians at one point in time. This was the uh, first tank, military tank assembled on assembly line rather than hand built one at a time. This was uh, the first tank that was built as an actual tank as we know them today. Originally, they were, were just infantry support, so they only did about 10 miles an hour. The, the Stuart did 35, and that, the British loved it in uh, North Africa because they could shoot at the Germans and then take off running and shoot again. It was the first shooting scoop. Another reason why Berwick and the ACF plant were on Hitler's hit list is because of all the armor plating that came out of that complex. Armor plate, of course, is what made the tanks and other equipment harder to damage during combat. Berwick was the only manufacturer of armor plate who did their own ballistics testing. Every, all the other manufacturers had to send their plates to uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds to be tested, but Berwick had such a volume that they did everything here. And the statistic we've been able to come up with is 10% of all the armor plate produced in the United States for World War II came out of Berwick and one-eighth of all the armor vehicles produced in the United States for World War II came from the ACF, and every single armored vehicle produced in the United States for World War II had at least one piece of Berwick armor plate on it. As you can now see, Berwick and the ACF's contribution to the war effort was quite significant, if not unique. At the peak, there were 9,135 workers at the ACF from 177 municipalities in northeastern Pennsylvania, just producing equipment for the Second World War. And the Stuart was just part of it. When they got done with the Stuarts, they built 10,000 bulldozers for the Army. On top of all the railroad cars they also built here, and they built rail car mounted power plants for the bombed out cities of Russia here in Berwick. All, all this during the Second World War, all out of this small town. So the, the history here is just tremendous. And it's so great to have these World War II veterans here, these veterans of the production line at the ACF and all their families, so we could show them our appreciation. And that is really what trying to bring Stewie home is all about. Showing appreciation to the thousands and thousands of Americans who either fought with them or built them. Unfortunately, there were only about 150 Stuart Light tanks still in this country. So finding one to bring home permanently has proved to be a bit trying. Well, all the ones that are owned by the military are at VFWs or American Legions. And they don't want to give them up. Uh, if one goes, if a, if a VFW folds up, uh, then that might become available, but we're, we're at the back of the line, so, uh, but we're, we're at the back of the line, but now we're at least in line uh, to get one. Uh, the other problem is uh, all the other ones that we've found are privately owned and they've been restored, which makes them wonderful vehicles because then we could drive them around here but they're in a neighborhood of $200,000, plus or minus. Uh, it takes a lot of money to restore one of them. If, if we had the money to buy it, then we would need to be able to uh, maintain it and all that. Now, we don't have the money to buy one, let alone to get it here and keep it maintained and stuff. If we had somebody that would be willing to help us out with that financially, we'd need a, somebody that's done well for themselves that could free up that kind of money. Uh, but. Having, having the tank here that, that ran uh, gave us something really unique. Uh, so now if we can get one here that we can have on a static display that people can come and look at and reminisce, uh, that would really complete our, our mission. And once it's here, then it's, then it's here for the rest of the time and, and people can continue. It'll keep that part of the Burrick history and the ACF alive.
There are a number of Stuart Light tanks available in other countries, but in the mid-1990s, a law was passed making it illegal to bring American-made war surplus vehicles back into the country. Now that, plus the huge expense of shipping such a heavy vehicle, makes an out-of-country purchase nearly impossible. And what is sad to some is that most of the Stuart Light tanks used in the Pacific were scuttled, dumped into the ocean, presumably due to the expense of bringing them back to the United States. So they really are a rare commodity. Still, even to have Stewie home for just the weekend was quite exciting. With the bicentennial, an opportunity presented itself that having done that now has uh, given us something that a static display never could. Being able to put Fred Shepherdly in, in the turret and let him ride something that he made 70 years ago, uh, did something for him and uh, some of the other WW2 vets that are still here, like uh, Joe Zielinski and Joe Messina, who got to talk about it and say, there's where my mark was, and, and talk about what they did back then. I, I get talking about it too much. I might get emotional. I don't want to do that. But what did it mean to those, to those fellas to be able to ride one and, and to talk about it and see it going down the street? Oh my gosh. Uh, and, and you heard, if you heard it once, you heard it a thousand times that day. My dad worked there. My, my uncle, my grandfather all worked there and from all over. So they were all coming and getting their pictures and sending it to relatives that live far away. Um, asked to do it again, I would do it again in a heartbeat. We were so glad that Steve Greenberg, the owner of the tank, said, yeah, the, okay, I'm gonna bring my tank 3,000 miles to help you celebrate. He got so much out of this. This is uh, where this tank was actually made. Burwick, what's it like to have this back where it was actually made? Well, it's pretty neat. There's an awful lot of history here, and, and all the people I met here, it's amazing to talk to people that worked on the tanks, that fought in the tanks. What have you heard from some of the people that actually were here that actually worked on these tanks? Oh, they, they're just unbelievable. A lot, of guys, a lot of the guys that worked on the tanks, I've talked to one guy that was a welder that was showing me how he put the welding marks on the t on the tank and and it was just neat talking to someone like that that actually actually built the tanks. Steve who was from the Portland Oregon area actually bought this particular Stewart tank in 2003 from someone a little closer to home. Steve Krentler from Bethlehem Pennsylvania. He was also on hand along with his son William to give us a little history on where this particular tank has been for the past 70 years. Well uh, the original owner was the US Army of course. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they uh, gave it to the Brazilians uh, either late in the war or after the war, part of the, uh, the Allied program. Brazil was an ally. I bought it from a surplus dealer who uh, brought them in from Brazil in 1990 in New York, uh, lower New York State. Uh, and I lived in northern New Jersey at the time. Um, had the tank for several years, finally got it running and looking similar to the way it looks now. Moved to Pennsylvania in uh, 1998 and uh, had the tank there for a few years and then sold it to the current owner, Steve Greenberg, in 2003. How tough was it to get the 70-year-old engine running? Well, it, um, actually, when I got the tank, it didn't have an engine. I had to find an engine, um, which I did along with other parts, uh, a lot of disassembly work, um, a lot of restoration work. When I bought the tank, Steve had put a new engine in it and repainted the outside of it. And I had, when I got the tank, I had taken the turret off and redid the whole inside of it, rewired the entire tank, and pulled the engine out and cleaned the engine department, got the, the fire extinguisher system going. And what makes a guy want to buy a tank? Why not? No, I guess it was, uh, you know, collecting military and weapons and things like that. You, the ultimate is a tank for a, for, a, for a gearhead and for a military collector. I've been collecting military vehicles since high school, I'm about 55 now, and I used to have, I had an armored scout car and I owned, I owned a duck and Jeeps and Dodges and just, I thought, well, Maybe I need to own a tank, so there you are. And, and having this particular tank made here in Berwick come back home, what's that? Feel? Oh, it's 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 really exciting. Um, I, I I'm very impressed with the community that the, the way they've come out and and the stories. I met six or seven folks that worked at the factory today, and, and numerous people talking about their dads, their uncles, their grandfathers who worked in the factory. Um, where I grew up, we didn't have those kind of factories, and and it's neat that the town is still tight and, and remembers all those things because it was such a big part of the fabric of the community. And part of being a member of a community that made tanks for a living meant occasionally seeing one driving down the road. 
a fact that was not lost on Steve and the tank committee. I understand you guys had a little fun this morning driving this around town. Yeah, yeah, we did. After we brought it up and got it unloaded, uh, we were, we were going to need to get gas. So what the owner, Steve Greenberg, wanted to do, he wanted. We went up to the BIDA, and we got in front of one of the old buildings that's left, and got some pictures there. So he has that uh, for his portfolio. And then it was lunchtime and Steve likes uh, Subway. So we went, we drove it right uptown and parked right in front of Subway. We went in and had lunch. Uh, then we came back down and uh, it needed gas. So uh, we pulled into a gas station and got gas because it takes uh, regular gas. Now he had to put uh, lead additive in because uh, back in the day that's it took leaded gas. Everywhere we went, people were stopping and taking pictures and looking at it and asking questions. People driving down the road had their cameras out, taking pictures of it. To drive the tank right down the street in Burke like we did earlier today, it was like 70 years ago. I can see what it was like for some of these guys when they were my, you know, younger than me, obviously, doing the same thing. Don't get to do it a lot, but when, when I get the opportunity, it's, it's a lot of fun. The day concluded with a ceremony honoring all of our veterans and to the delight of the crowd, featured the firing of a few volleys from the tank. As Commissioner Kovach says, the committee is now finally on a federal waiting list for a STEWI to become available. And when that happens, you can expect another big celebration. Hopefully, something as big as the one in the 1940s, when the making of the tanks was celebrated in Berwick. A truly amazing and historical experience for everyone involved. As we said, efforts continue to bring a Stewie home permanently. If you would like to help out, you can contribute to the fund. The information is on your screen. In fact, when they finally do find a Stewie to bring home permanently, they plan on putting it on that grassy area at the entrance to the old ACF complex in Berwick. It's now Beta, and they plan on making that a permanent memorial to everyone in the area who lived and worked and died to keep America free. A fitting tribute indeed. That'll do it for this episode of Metrocasting. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you again after later.